sanctuary was over last month, the Lord dropped into my heart. Um, Pastor Rich Van Winkle, who's Rebecca and my spiritual mom and dad, basically, got some news that his bladder wasn't working the way it should, that it was worn out. And, and I got the text, you know, uh, you guys know I'm on a mission trip, right, for two years. I've been on a mission trip for two years in a high school. Yeah. I've been teaching high school for two years. That's probably the hardest mission trip you'll ever go on. So, one of them. Anyway, so I got that, and instantly the Lord showed me a lion roaring at Rich and Dorothy and his family trying to get them to be afraid. I saw this picture of a lion. I thought, wow. I said, that's good. I need to go home and pray about that. And I got home, and I got some more news that day. And instantly I saw a lion roaring at me trying to get me to be afraid, intimidate me, scare me. And then last Tuesday, some of you know, I get, we... Uh, my son texted me, he's been battling methamphetamines for about three years, two, two and a half years, that he had tried to take his life and did not succeed. And instantly he said, I knew I wasn't supposed to do that, and went to the ER, and so he's doing fine, but that lion was roaring and roaring, trying to intimidate us and scare us. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, why do lions roar? Anyone, anyone know why? We, you, you hear this from a bunch of different pastors. And listen, I've heard a lot of teachings on lions from pastors. And they're all good. I mean, it's, it's absolutely amazing the analogies you can make with lions and Satan. And um, basically, a lion will roar at you, usually an old lion with no teeth. And he will roar at you and scare you the other way into the waiting pride. They've got a pride of lions waiting for you. That's usually why lions will roar that way. Or they will, if the pack is together, they will roar, get you to run the other. As soon as you turn your back and run, they jump on you and grab you by the neck. So we're going to talk about some lions tonight, all right? Basically, Peter is the one that said this best. Now, remember, Peter, the devil asked if he could sift Peter like wheat. Remember that? And... Peter learned to have victory over Satan. Satan didn't get Peter. He wanted to, but he did not. And so in 1 Peter 5.8, we do have slides, yes. Okay, 1 Peter 5.8, he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So Peter is telling us about a spiritual reality. All right? What he's saying is that there's a predator in our lives that are always trying to get to us, the devil. Now listen, we're not going to glorify the devil tonight. We're not going to just talk about the devil and how Listen, we're not doing that. What I'm saying is part of victory in this lifetime is knowing your enemy. Now you guys know I was in the military, you know I was in Iraq, you know all these things about me. And the most important thing is to know your enemy. You can't defeat your enemy unless you know your enemy. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk a little bit about that, okay? Because Satan is not omnipresent like God is. God can be everywhere at once. Satan cannot. Now, we all know that one-third of the angels fell. So he's got his minions that do his bidding for him. So Satan is not as big as television makes him. He's not as, as, as powerful as television makes him, all right? Um, you need to understand, though, that there is an enemy, whether you see him or not, and he's out there, okay? So let's be aware, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. The good news is, Peter says that Satan is looking for someone who he may devour. Now, when it says when he may devour, that is not permission. Who he may devour requires something on our part. It doesn't say he can devour. It says who he may devour, all right? So, Jesus defeated Satan on the cross. So, we have authority, we have power over him, but we have to know what our authority is, all right? In Luke 10, verse 19, Jesus said, I give you authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. So, my question is, why are so many Christians being harmed? Why are so many marriages being ripped apart? Why are so many families being torn apart? If we have this authority, why are Christians still being devoured and mauled? It's a good question. I think it's because we forget that 
we're living in wartime. We are living in wartime against an enemy. People forget that. A lot of misconception is, oh, once you become Christians, guess what? You're safe. You're on base. They can't touch you. Nothing can come against you. Now listen, there's some truth to that, but you have to know what your tools are. You have to know your authority. And I'm going to say that a million times tonight. If we don't know what our tools are, how can you use them? So we need to understand that there is an enemy out there, and he is roaming, seeking whom he may devour. Now, Jesus said the enemy comes only to steal, kill, and what? Destroy. Destroy. Listen, that, that, that's a pretty laid out blueprint there. There's certain to steal, to kill, destroy. That's for our relationships, that's our marriages, that's our finances, that's our health. So he's seeking whom he may devour, destroy, steal, or kill, right? It's pretty simple, right? All right. Now, Peter is a phenomenal book. It tells us that we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That's who we are. God made us according to his royal bloodline. Come on now, think about this. We, if we are royalty, how are we letting someone as petty as Satan take our things? We need to stand up in that with confidence and with faith. He's reminding us that the devil is, he's a great threat. Don't get me wrong. He's a great threat, but we have to be aware of him. Once we're aware of him, we can do things to make sure that he doesn't do that to us or our family. Now, I know a lot of you are standing in faith and standing in prayer for a lot of people in your family. So what we need to do, I think our next step is we need to make sure we understand who we are and use that authority. And make sure our family understands the authority that they have. All right. So Peter basically gives us two pieces of advice. The first is to be sober. Now, Darren, what's it like to be sober? <laughs> why am I asking Darren? Because, anyway. Because <laughs> he's my friend. That's why. Sober. Now, we all know people that are drunk. What happens? They, they stumble around. They fall over. They're really not aware of what's going on around them. Right? So we have to be sober and be in control of ourselves. We have to be in control of ourselves. Being sober is staying in control of my passion. We have to keep that under control because once we lose control of our passion, then it becomes a stronghold. So we need to stay in control. We need to stay sober. Anything out of control, the devil is control of. And that includes the words we speak. So we really need to make sure we stay in control on that. Whenever we lose control, that area becomes what we call a bondage. And, and we talked about that in, in one of our sanctuaries, about how we get rid of those bondages. We have to stay in control of our passions and desires. The second is to be vigilant or be watchful. Um, you have to have a wartime mentality. You can't just get lax. You can't take your foot off the gas. You have to make sure you're in a wartime mentality. Now, I, was, I did a lot of research on this. I, I watched, uh, you know, when he started talking about lions, I went to Nat Geo, and I went to this Alert Lions page, and I was reading about their behaviors and their habits. And also, Pastor Jimmy Evans, who's a good friend of Pastor John Chastain here, has a really good sermon on that that was amazing. And I'm going to give him some credit for, for some examples tonight that I... That, it's the same thing the Lord was showing me, but he said it so much more eloquently. So I'm gonna, I'll refer to Pastor Jimmy on that. But who remembers 9-11? Uh, Bad time, right? Most of you were alive, right? Okay. That's where this grade comes from. 9-11. Now, who remembers before 9-11? Anyone remember flying on airplanes before 9-11? Then you remember after 9-11. Now, I flew from Seattle to Newark, New Jersey, a bunch when I was living up there, when I was working up there. And after 9-11, it was the biggest pain in the bottom ever to fly. But I'll tell you what, I'd get on that airplane, I would sit down, and I'd watch every person that came on that plane. And I started picking out who was friend or foe. I started thinking exactly, all right, who am I going to... Who's, <laughs> what am I going to do if this guy tries to do this? You know, and I'm just being transparent with you. That's being vigilant. You have to watch. You have to understand that even though you're in a safe environment, people that may try to come, may try to harm you, may try to do things to you or your family. We need to be vigilant. 
If somebody told you, okay, I left something in this house, your wife, whoever, I, I need you to go back in there and get it. I left it when I was in there. I went to look at this house, and you had to go back in that house. And let's say they also told you that house has a lot of rattlesnakes in it. You have to go in that house. But there's a lot of rattlesnakes in there. Would you consider that vigilant? If you had to walk in there, are you kidding me? I'd walk in that house and I'd be looking at, you know, I wouldn't take a step until there was like a 10-foot radius around me that I knew was clear. That's not paranoid. Please, please hear my heart on this. I'm not asking you to be paranoid. I'm asking you to be vigilant. It's like if you had to walk home, your car broke down, and, it, and it's dark at night. You know, you would be vigilant, and you have to be, okay? The reason Peter says we have to be sober and vigilant is, what does he say? Does he say everyone's enemy? What's the word he uses? Your. He says your. He makes it very personal. He, and understand this. You have a special calling on your life which means there's a special attack on your life. Okay, so your adversary, he's our enemy. We all like being peaceful and love everybody and, you know, all of this, but you have no choice in the matter because he hates you. He hates you. He wants you dead. He hates your guts. And the nicer you are and the better you are, the more he hates you. And that's, that's, an, that's a truth. So please, sober and vigilant. Now, it also says he prowls around, which means he's active. Now listen, he's not going to wait till you come to his territory. He's prowling around. He's going to come to your territory. He's going to come to where you are. Now he listens for everything, every word that comes out of your mouth. You ever wake up and, and go, you know what? Oh, I just don't feel good today. I feel, thank you. That's what he's saying. He's saying, oh, thank you. Or, I, you know what, I can't be around that person because when I'm around them, I think they are so attractive. You know, he's saying thank you. He's building his arsenal to use against you. That's why we have, there's life and death in our tongues. We need to make sure we control that, all right? He's prowling around, waiting for us to make a mistake. He's seeking someone who he may devour. That's what he's doing. Satan is also seeking total destruction. He's a destroyer. He's a devourer. He is not a finicky eater. He is looking for complete destruction. He's looking to devour you completely. And I, I, you're going to get this, and you probably already have. I'm, gonna, I'm painting a picture tonight to show you he has nothing to mess around with. He's not. We learn who he is, we're aware of him, and we build our arsenal, which is our authority. All right? Peter's been trying to warn us about an unseen enemy. Now, many innocent people, their lives, their marriage, their, their children, you know, their work, their finances, all of these things, they're Christians, but they have no idea exactly what they're allowing in their lives. Now today, I knew this morning when I woke up, I felt like a train wreck. I felt, and you can ask Rebecca, these days we get to do sanctuary once a month, I wake up, I get up early, I always get in there, I spend time with the Lord and pray and just, you know, confirm what he's asking me to talk to you about, to, you know, that night. And today, all day, in the back of my mind, you don't want to go tonight. You don't want to go. You don't want to be there. You don't want to go tonight. You don't feel good. You don't do that. And I knew something good was gonna, going on tonight. I knew somebody was going to be here that needed to hear this. And so I got, I got energized. I got motivated. And I'll just be honest with you. I, I was in the worst mood today you can call it a mood if you want but I wasn't being mean or hateful to anybody I just didn't feel good all day so I knew what he was trying to do so and we get emails from people from Africa and Australia and people that watch this our little sanctuary so somebody and it's in this room or there all of you hopefully listen it's for you so you do not have to be afraid of the devil you don't have to live in fear as long as you understand that he's there and you walk properly and be aware you can live safely. So, what are the nature of lions? Now, these analogies about lions that you hear all the time, that's what I was studying so much because it was, it was amazing to me, the analogies of lions, because we live in a fallen world. 
and there are predators out there and a lion is a predator and he's one of the better predators you can have fun and you can live among predators because of what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago so when we walk out in the parking lot I just want you to understand there are predators out there but you don't have to be afraid of that you don't have to worry about that we know Jesus he lives inside of us and if you don't we're gonna fix that tonight you don't have to be afraid just be aware and know your authority please understand I'm gonna say that over and over tonight so just get ready for that I want that to sink in all right as long as you know how to act be sober and be vigilant all right I want you to hear something about lions nature that I thought was really interesting once within range of prey lions use their paw to slap the rear of the animal at its legs or haunch to knock it off balance and drag it down a bite to the throat or neck quickly kills the animal well, how many times have you felt like you've had your feet knocked out from under you you've had something go on in your life and you just feel like lord i just feel like i've been knocked down listen a lion will knock your feet out from under you and jump on you and bite your throat now, me personally, I thought, man, I felt like that a bunch. So, Satan always tips his hand. He'll always overplay his hand. Satan will. And, and, and so this, when I was reading this, I knew exactly what he was trying to tell me, the Lord was trying to tell me. If you feel like you've been knocked down on the ground and it's hard to get back up, you're probably under attack. And that's why as a family, as a group here, we get together, we pray for you, we pray over you, you text us, you call us, you email us, whatever. And we'll do that. We'll, we'll get together and not let that attack happen. Amen. The enemy is trying to bite your throat to kill you. With larger prey, lions approach the animal at an angle, jumping on top, using their weight to wrestle the animal to the ground, biting at the vertebrae in an attempt to sever the spinal cord as they do so. How many times have you felt like the weight of the world was on your shoulder? Like you're just carrying everything possible on your back. Like I can't, Lord, I can't take anything else. I cannot teach another freshman as long as I live. <laughs> and I know what it is. And luckily, I've got a wonderful wife who, who helps me, encourages me, and reminds me, you know, and, and we get with the Lord, and, you know, and I'm ready to go the next day. So I'm telling you, these are analogies with lions that make a lot of sense in our walk as Christians. This is where depression and suicidal thoughts come in. People get so weighted down, they feel like they cannot lift their head up. This is what's going on with our son. That's why we build him up. We constantly give him the word. We talk to him. We just send him texts like, hey, we love you. How are you doing? We make him laugh because that weight can get extremely heavy. Listen to what they do when you're down on the ground. Once down, they bite the throat or cover the nose and mouth of the prey to suffocate it. This is no joke. The enemy's trying to take you down and either bite your neck or suffocate you. Now, I've felt like I've been suffocating before, just where it's been so heavy on me, or things are just piling up and piling up, and the finances, and Rebecca needs more makeup, and you know, just stuff like that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. To, Lord, I apologize. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. It's... <laughs> Darren? I may need a ride home, brother. <laughs> One more thing I found very interesting about lions. Uh, maybe it was just me, but maybe you'll see what I mean. Lions usually start feeding by opening the abdomen and eating the heart. They go after your heart. Then they eat your liver and your kidneys. It says they rarely... I'm not trying to be graphic here. I'm just saying they rarely open the skull, but what I'm saying is they open the abdomen and they go for the heart. Wow. So the analogies just don't stop. They continue to be there. A predator is, is tracking you down. He's hunting after you. And if you don't know who you are, you don't, in your awareness, you're not being vigilant, you can be trapped. Okay? Now... Lions are nocturnal. Lions hunt in the night. Their eyes are made so they see up to eight times better than a human being at night. The night belongs to the predators. Now, 
Pastor Jimmy Evans was talking about, he went on a safari. I've never been on a safari. I have no desire to go on a safari, to be honest with you. I know Rebecca does. I do not. But Pastor Jimmy, since he went on a safari, I thought I would borrow one of his stories. And I'm sure he wouldn't mind because it really opened my eyes. And that is, he said that one night they got warned not to go outside of their cabins at night because they were actually in a safari camp. They go out so far, they camp, they stay the night, they go the next day. Some of you may have been. Um, he said they, they said, do not go outside unless you're armed or have an armed guard with you. He goes, he goes, during the day, we own the camp. During the night, the animals own the camp. Do not go outside at night without an armed guard. So he said, you know, he's a big old boy being from Texas. He got very hungry that day <laughs> after a safari. And their escort was supposed to pick him up, armed escort, and take him to dinner. He said he was late. So he said he just kept opening the door, walking out on the porch, looking, and his wife said, shut that door. And he said, I'm hungry. You know, it's been, and she goes, shut the door. So about 45 minutes later, uh, the guard shows up and he goes, hey, he goes, sorry, I'm late. Um, there was a cheetah on your front porch. So the guard had been watching and saw the cheetah on his front porch. Jimmy kept going out on the front porch looking and there was a cheetah sitting right there on his front porch. He said he walked out just like Gomer going, hey, where's my food? And he said that poor cheetah was probably going, oh, he's new. It's his first day. I'm not going to eat him today. <laughs> I had to laugh about that, too. I thought that was funny. But, but what he said is he said, I innocently stepped out into the night looking for the guard. Innocently or not, when you step into the darkness, you're in grave danger. Amen. So just remember the night belongs to the enemy. There's nowhere in the Bible where it contests that the enemy owns the night. You cannot cast Satan out of his own property. Remember, we talked about that. He owns, he is allowed certain parts of this world. And so we have to understand the difference in that, okay? We think, well, the reasons many are failing is, I think, because they think they can sin and still be safe. Do I understand that? They think that they can, they can still dip into the darkness a little bit and be safe. So we think we can wander into the darkness and not experience the penalty of darkness. The darkness belongs to the devil. You can't cast him off as his property. So we all wrestle with sin. We're not perfect. We all wrestle with sin. Now there's, there, there's darkness and then there's light. Now, where the two overlap, what's that called? There's dusk. Now, this is what we call a dusk issue. If you've got sin in your life, and it could be uh, something you're struggling with, something that you're dealing with, that's a dusk issue because we're struggling to get that out of our life toward the light. The problem is, is when you turn and go into the darkness and you start justifying it. My wife is not showing me enough affection, so I'm going to go off in the darkness for a little bit. I need to just, I need to lose myself for a little bit. I need to just, you know, I'm going to try these drugs just to, I don't want to feel the pain anymore. They step into the darkness. Believe me, when you turn to go in the darkness, you are in grave danger. So if we're battling a dusk issue, that's what we're here for. That's what we do. This is why we're family. This is why we get together and talk about things. That's why we, anything that's in the darkness that you bring into the light becomes light. So if we're struggling and we keep that stuff in and we're not sharing it, and listen, I don't mean go off and share with a total stranger. I don't mean that. I mean, get with your pastor. Get with, if you don't have a pastor, you don't, this is, we're not trying to take your church place. But if you don't have a church, listen, this is why we're here. This is a ministry where we welcome everybody. And if you need someone to talk to, that is what Rebecca and I and our team does. That's what we do. There are a lot of marriages suffering, and usually it isn't people playing with darkness on, with, with, with both people. Usually someone in that marriage is stepping into the darkness thinking they can keep the devil on their doorstep. A lot of marriages, so, you know, I was counseling for a while with my, finishing my PhD for clinical psychology, and a lot of marriages, a lot of marriages were because one party 
was doing things in the darkness. So you have to be aware of that when you're talking to people, when you're loving on people, when you're counseling to people. You can't tell you cannot play with that stuff. Proverbs 10, verse 9. He who walks in integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his way will become known. Be careful how you live. You can have fun being sober and being vigilant. Anybody here used to have fun on the dark side? It wasn't fun, was it? You go out and drink so much you threw up, right? What kind of fun is that? The most fun I've ever had is loving Jesus and getting together with these yahoos. I say that in a loving way, yahoos. Because we have a good time, and we enjoy each other, and we don't throw up and get sick and get diseases. Right? All right. That's enough on that spill. All right. Lions see things differently. Now, we talked about this a little bit with their eyes, but they see things different. Uh, lions on a safari will see a safari truck, and they'll see it as one big picture. They see it as one big item. They see it as a big picture. They do not see the individual characteristics of that. The, the trucks smell funny. They think they're compe- you know, just another big animal. So they don't really pay much attention to those. Uh, matter of fact, on safaris, they'll drive right up to a pride of lions so people can get pictures of that. They'll drive right up to a new kill while they're feeding on a new kill so people can get pictures. Like I say, I don't want to go on a safari, but as long as you stay on the truck and as long as you stay part of the big picture, you're fine. And you get used to that. The guides will warn you, do not stand up. Do not get out of the truck. Do not make sudden movements. Because those those lions, those big cats, will be there just licking their paws, and someone will stand up, and instantly their eyes are drawn. Who has a cat? Anyone have a crazy cat like we do? (laughs) We'll be laying there just messing around, and I'll move my hand or something, and he just, you know, he looks at my hand or my sandwich. (laughs) And it's the same thing with the big cat. So they warn you, the guides will tell you, do not make sudden movements, do not stand up, do not get out of the truck. What that does is it separates you from the big picture. Now you become a single profile. You're standing out. There was a headline about a Japanese tourist. that You go on these things and they're days long. And you you stay in that truck and you get so used to being around them that people tend to forget. And this one Japanese guy jumped out of the truck to get a closer picture. Instantly, it, uh, one of the lions jumped on him, grabbed his throat, killed him, and started eating him in front of his family. Wow. Instantly. They said it was just so quick that you couldn't even, you know, and I was reading the article going, oh, my goodness. A lot of analogies that match up. So what's my point? Matthew 18, verse 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, for their Two or three are gathered, for where two or three are gathered, together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So do you realize that when two people get together, a married couple, uh, a a leadership team, three people, three or four, a a group of people get together in my name, which means for for the sake of Jesus, getting there to further his kingdom. Do you realize when you get together, he's in the midst, right there with you. So when you come together... Jesus is there, you're creating a big picture. Just like the truck out in the, in the midst of predators. You are creating a big picture. The enemy will look at that picture and only see Jesus. They won't see you sticking out like a single picture. They won't see you by yourself. He sees Jesus. And that's the big picture that we want. He's not dumb enough to attack Jesus. Jesus defeated him 2,000 years ago. Lions will never attack a big picture, a herd, or a pack. What they do is they jump up and start running, and they will wait for that herd for one or two to splinter off or the sick or the lame to be behind, and they see the singular picture. And they instantly, they'll they'll pounce on them. So the herd is still intact as long as they stay together, right? Right? They are looking for the one that separates from the herd. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. 
We find that people that are suffering in, in divorce, um, I mean, their marriage is failing. They suffer in divorce. We find a lot that normally they are unteachable. They're, usually they're unteachable. They're independent. Um, they don't get help. They don't ask for prayer. They, they, they pretty much stay by themselves. And so what are they doing? They're separating. They're pulling away from the herd. That's why us as ministers, as pastors, as, as family, that's why it's important that we have this group. Because as soon as I see one of you, or Rebecca, or any, or you, anyone sees someone straying away, we call them. We email them. We go by their house. We check on them. Because that's part of our herd. That's our pack. That's our family. And we know when they start isolating themselves, going off by themselves, there's a target on them. Satan can see the ones that stick out individually. We need to stick together. Satan wants us to mess up. He wants us to feel ashamed. And when, he, when we feel ashamed, we've done something wrong. We've messed up in the church. We've messed up with a friend. We've done it. He wants us to feel that way so that we pull away. He wants that. That is part of his plan so he can devour us. And we're not going to let that happen. We're not going to do that. Matter of fact, when we're, when we're struggling, we need each other more. That's the, that's the time we need each other. Anyone can do fine when things are going perfectly. You've got enough money to pay bills. You've got enough money to go on vacations. You've got, you know, your health is wonderful. You've never, you know, that's fine. That's fine. It's easy to do. What's, well, the problem is when we get sick. We know someone's sick. We know someone's struggling financially. That's when we need to really come together. We really need to be there for each other during that. Lions are territorial. And some of these safaris, they actually get out on foot. They do what's called a foot safari. And the reason they do that is because they're trying to show you and teach you a lesson that lions, when they roar and you're on foot, and they come running up to you. Well, I've got to stop there for a second. I have to tell you something. So I was reading these stories about safari. And Pastor Jimmy was talking about how there was a group from Europe. They got out. They were on safari. And they were walking, and he said, when lions, if, if we see lions, don't run, right? That's why in Africa, a lot of these tribes, they have masks that look like a face on the back of their head. Because when they turn around, the lion thinks they're still looking at him, and they won't grab their neck. Well, the, the guide was telling this group, don't run. Don't run. So this group from Europe, when this, this, these lions showed up, they took off running. I think he said they were from France. So anyway, the guide, I'm a military guy, I'm sorry. The, the guide stepped between the lion and the, and the group that was running away to save their lives. And when he did that, the lion stopped. You know why? Because he knew what authority he had, and they didn't. And they said, the lions will run up to you growling, and they'll stop, and the male will urinate at your feet, and then run off marking their territory. So, <laughs> ha, we might have to erase that part on there. So how did he know that? In Genesis 1, Genesis 1, chapter 1, God gave us the world. He gave us authority. Genesis chapter 3, Satan came, and the reason he went to Adam and Eve is because he wanted that authority. He wanted to rule the world. When they sinned, they gave him dominion of the world at that point. So in Matthew and Luke 4, where Satan is tempting Jesus, he says, if, if you will just bow down to me and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of the earth because they had been given to him. Right? And we know that because um, Jesus died on the cross and took back that authority. Because in Matthew 28, after his resurrection, Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore. Right? So what does, what does this mean? Is You have a destiny in your life, and that destiny is your territory. Your destiny in your life is your territory, and that's what Satan is trying to keep you from. Your promised land has giants. It always does. Fear is how Satan controls us, and he tries to do it with fear. In Genesis 9, verse 2, God put the fear of man on the animals. 
So when those guides knew all they had to do was step between the group and the lines, the guides knew exactly their authority. The group did not. One of the guides made a comment. He said, once an elephant in musk, which means it's a time where they're giving off this hormone, this descent, they are extremely uh, angry, and they make these loud noises, and they will attack just about anything. Once when these elephants were in musk, he come charging through the woods, there was a group on foot, and the, the guide said, don't run. So this elephant came out, huge elephant, just making this noise and moving its head back and forth, trying to make him afraid, and come charging toward him. And the guy just <laughs> clapped his hands like that. He said the elephant started making more noises and charged him even more and got close to him, and the guy just did that, and the elephant stopped and ran off. I think it was Pastor Jimmy was saying, I don't know what you're doing with your hands, but keep it up. <laughs> he knew his authority. He didn't let fear or the noise or the sight intimidate him and scare him away. The guides knew who they were. The tourists didn't. The reason the devil has his way with so many Christians is we do not know who we are. We don't know the authority that we have. Jesus said, I give you authority over serpents and snakes. Nothing shall by any means harm you. We need to know that. We need to live that. It's easy to say, but we need to do it. We really need to do that. This means we do not need to give our territory over to the devil any longer, but we need to take our territory back and keep going forward. That's what we need to do. He comes and roars in your face. You're not good enough. You messed up. You're a sinner. You've been divorced. You've done all of these things. He comes and roars in your face telling you those things. But I'm telling you, we have the authority of Jesus Christ in our life. So I want to do a little roaring back. All right. In the spirit realm, fear isn't an emotion. It's a response. It doesn't matter what you're feeling. It matters what you do. Every hero who has ever done anything heroic felt fear when they did it. It didn't matter what they felt. It mattered what they did. Being in Iraq, I had a bunch of heroes all around me. Some of them made it home, some of them didn't. Not one of them turned their back and ran. Every one of them did what they had to do. So I'm telling you, we cannot let fear get it, take a hold. Once you do, he's taking your territory, and we need to take our territory back. Stand up for your marriage. Stand up for your family. Stand up for your future and stand up for your destiny. That's promised to us. When you go outside, understand there's going to be lions out here. Just understand the nat their nature. Be sober and be vigilant. Be who God made you to be and use your God-given authority. James 4, 7, I'll tell you one more. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Again, the charge is to resist, but it's directly coupled with submission to God. Submission is the voluntary act of placing yourself under the authority of another to show respect and give obedience. If we submit to God, Satan will flee. So I'm going to challenge you tonight. I want you to understand that the authority that you've been given is good enough. It's strong enough. It's better than the, than the enemies ever will be. As loud as it sounds, as ugly as it looks, as bad as you feel... Your authority trumps that. Amen.